Welcome to our April episode of Chess TV. In this episode, Professor Arne Johansson continues the hunt for chess history at the Royal Library here in Sweden. We have the opening score with Alfred and Adriana, a chess puzzle with a checkmate in three moves for you, and of course some chess news with Albert. Let's begin with the news that the British charity Chess in Schools and Communities, CSC, and the New Hampshire Borough Council and East Village have started a new innovative project with the name Urban Chess. The goal of the project is to add chess to the education in 64 primary schools in Newham and to teach 20,000 children how to play chess. Lately, chess in schools have gotten a high reputation in Great Britain thanks to the efforts of CSC. The initiative has been a success that has gotten much attention and many positive criticisms not least by Newham's mayor himself. The initiative is, however, not unique for just Britain. Lately, chess was added to the cu curriculum in Hungary after the model of Armenia. Let's hope kids all over the world get a chance to learn how to play chess. After 10 tough rounds, the Women's Team World Championship of 2013 that was played in Kazakhstan was finished. Of nine possible match points, Ukraine took seven victories and two draws, which gave them the gold in the very prestigious tournament. Ukraine was closely followed by China, that was only a match point behind, and Russia won the gold bronze. Congratulations! The Russian Chess Federation has announced a new tournament in memory of Alexander Alyekhin, who was the fourth world champion in chess between 1927 and 1946 with just one exception of a two-year gap under which he lost the title. The starting field of 10 players is led by the second highest rated player in the world, Vladimir Kranik, the world's number three, Levan Aronian, and the current world champion, Anand. The last round of Zurich Chess Challenge was as far as you can get from an uneventful round. In the last round, Kranik and Anand played against each other, and to everyone's surprise, Kramnik made a mistake in a very strong position against the world champion, which Anand managed to grab onto and win the game. That was, however, not enough for Anand to win the tournament, and instead 20-year-old Fabiano Caruana came out victorious from the six rounds after victory in the last round against Israeli Grandmaster Boris Gelfand in 58 moves. World champion Anand came in second place followed by Kramnik. Congratulations! The fifth edition of Batavia tournament, which was played in Amsterdam, has now been finished. The expectations of who would win the tournament came to change drastically after that the first seed, Grandmaster Dimitri Reiderman, who was in the lead after seven rounds, unexpectedly lost his two last games. A strong effort by international master Van Bull from the Netherlands and Alan Greenfeld from Israel resulted in a shared first place. Despite missing a Grandmaster norm by just a half a point, Van Bury made an, an, ex an exceptional achievement in this Grandmaster tournament. For more information, visit batavia1920.nl slash chess. We end with the news that the 20th edition of Ben Rattle Chess Festival in Ireland has been finished. The tournament was first played in 1994 and has been a very successful event all of the years since. It might be thanks to the quite unusual ingredient. The games are not federated, which is actually very unusual considering the level of the participants. This means that the players don't have to worry about their ratings while playing, which in turn results in a quite friendly and relaxed atmosphere that defines the tournament. The winner was Grandmaster Michael Adams, who finished half a point ahead of Nigel Short, who shared second place with the international master Richard Bates. Congratulations! Welcome to a new episode of The Opening School. There can't be that many of you who've not noticed the Candidates Tournament, which was played between the 14th of March and the 2nd of April. The Candidates Tournament pitched the absolute top against each other during 14 rounds for the right to challenge world champion Anand for the title. 
With such high stakes, there was obviously a lot of really interesting games and openings. One of those worth looking at was the game between the two Russian Super Grandmasters, Peter Svidler and Alexander Grishuk. Wouldn't you say, Adriana? Of course, that's why we picked it. Well, Peter Svidler started a game like most of the games in this tournament with the d4, which was followed by Grishuk's knight to f6 and continued into a rather common line after c4, g6, knight to c3, bishop to g7, e4, and d6. White is taking complete control over the center, but knows that black soon will come to challenge him for it, either by playing e5 or c5. Just like Alfred said, this is a quite common position. The plan for white is to stabil stabilize the position by developing the pieces in a sort of calm manner. White can, of course, try to pressure black further by playing f4, but it tends to lead to positions that are more difficult to defend. And why should you make life more difficult, right? Right, but Swidler opted for the in-between way by playing f3, strengthening his fortress. Grishuk castle kingside. It's easy to dismiss this move as bad. White plays the king on such an exposed position considering the possibility for white to advance with the g and h pawn. But the fact is that such advances often lead to white's destruction since he suddenly gets too many weaknesses which easily can be exploited, while black on the other hand has an easy position to defend. Even if you feel that exciting rush of wanting to go into a full attack mode against the king's side, it's very important to round up your troops before you start, i.e. to develop all of your pieces properly before engaging in the attack. So Swidler played bishop to e3. Up to this point, black hasn't been especially aggressive, but that changed now when Grishik decided to push forward in the center with c5. Imagine this position, but with the pawn on g4 and the bishop back on c1. You don't have to be super skilled to realize that white will have a hard time to keep his position from crumbling apart. If we return to the game, the first thought that might put up in your head is that we now can capture it on c5, winning a pawn. After d takes on c5, d takes on c5, and bishop takes on c5. And it is indeed possible, but again it leaves white in a position where black gets the initiative because of white's open and underdeveloped position. Instead, Swidler decided to strengthen his center further by developing another piece, the g knight to e2. This was followed by knight to c6, d5, knight to e5, knight to g3 and h5. The black position is cramped, but white isn't that comfortable either, especially the knight on g3, which really has no good square to go to. White continued by playing bishop to e2, making space for the knight to move there after black's h4. Black has now reached a point where he can, from which he can't uh, improve his position further without making a breakthrough, and so black played e6 in an attempt to upset the solid white central pawn structure. White took this chance to press the black e5 knight away by playing f4. And this is where the opening gets really out of hand. Because here Grishuk surprised everyone by capturing on c4 with the knight. White can take the knight on c4, but even more astounding is that white also should. We have now reached a position where white is a piece up for a pawn, and there is really no forced way for black to regain his material. This is a pure sacrifice for the initiative. Grisha continued by playing b5, and after bishop takes on b5 and e takes on d5, uh, Swidler chose to play e5. This was followed by an exchange on e5, bishop to g4, pawn takes on f6, bishop takes on d1, pawn takes on g7, King takes on g7, bishop takes on c5, h3, rook takes on d1, h takes on g2, rook to g1, g takes on f1, queen, and king takes on f1. Of all the crazy stuff that could have happened, this is quite a surprise. The game ended almost 20 moves later in a draw and we truly recommend all of you to watch it to take a look at the entire game. But with that, we will end this week's episode of The Opening School. Bye!
now it's finally time for revenge for black after so many chess puzzles where white has checkmated poor black. So in this chess puzzle the challenge is to find a checkmate in that black performs on white in three moves. Good luck. From a material point of view, white has the upper hand in this position, a piece more for a pawn. But don't let yourself be fooled by this, because what really matters is the strategic position in the game. I'm not saying that it isn't easier to checkmate if you have more pieces than your opponent, which it can be, but I'm just saying that it isn't a given fact. We must in this position be aware of that if we were to move our queen, we could risk being checkmated on h7. Because of this, it lies in our interest to perform forcing moves or moves with a check. It wouldn't be entirely wrong if we could capture the bishop on e4 with a check, but right now the bishop is guarded by the queen. We also see that white has a potential weakness in the h1 to a8 diagonal against the king, which we definitely will try to exploit. The question is just how we're supposed to do that. We also understand that we should activate the queen in this attack, and most of all we would probably prefer a plan where the bishop and the queen act on the same diagonal. That wouldn't have been completely wrong. That kind of operation would however take too many moves, and it is probably not even possible. We must check in each move, and we have one check with the queen to f1. The king is unable to move to g2, leaving only one option for him, namely bishop to g1. We can't capture it now though, because the white queen could only capture back. What we really have to do is to keep an open mind and to not be afraid of sacrifice. What square can be, be both our bishop and our queen guard simultaneously? Well, f3 of course. So how about queen to f3 check? The king can't do anything but to get help from the bishop, so the bishop captures the queen. But look at this. The position is exactly what we wanted. Our bishop can finally capture the white bishop and with a checkmate. And isn't it ironic that the white queen stands so close to the fence but is oh so helpless on the white diagonal. The white king must simply admit his defeat. So well done everyone. Now it's time for chess history with Professor Arne Johansson at the Royal Library here in Stockholm. Here we go. Du har också då tagit fram en tryckt bok med det här som jag ser liggande där. Ja, som sagt, övergången från det handskrivna till det tryckta är väldigt intressant. Man kan påstå att vi genomgår en parallell utveckling idag när vi övergår från det tryckta till det digitala. Så man kan säga att här har vi en ny plattform helt enkelt. Och vi ser för det första att man har lyckats lösa detta väldigt, väldigt effektivt. Ungefär iPad storlek. Och det, det tema som vi har hela tiden är hur bra är själva läsupplevelsen. Och jag skulle säga att denna skrift visar att en läsupplevelse är nå 1505. Ja just det, jag tänkte precis fråga det. När den här var tryckt. 
1505 att man har löst text och bild kanske ett bättre sätt än man har gjort i dagens digitala lösningar. Inget under som sagt. Det här kommer ungefär, ungefär om vi säger 50 år efter tryckkonstens mm. uppfinning med rörliga typer. Nu har det gått ungefär 20 år i en digital verksamhet. Kanske når vi upp det om 30 år. Ja, det är någonting som utvecklas hela tiden när vi övergår till nästa paradigmskift i... Ja, men helt enkelt att paradigmet här varade i flera hundra år. Det är mm. det som är så intressant. Och skicket är ju fantastiskt. Den ser ut som den vore nytryckt fast den är 500 år gammal. Ja, ett kravmärkt. Det är det som, som man behöver helt enkelt. Materialen Material, måste vara bra. kravmärkt och um, mer behövs inte. Problemet Nej. uppstår när man börjar um, använda skumma ja, tre fibrer och annat när det kommer in. Ja. Det finns en liten färgupplevelse i den där för någon har inte jag men det är någon annan som har tryckt under med röd penna i boken också. Men en huvudanledning till att vi står här idag igen är att i min referenslitteratur så gick jag tillbaka och vi tittade, tittade vidare på det här med sesoliskriften och att det ju faktiskt finns en svensk översättning av den gjord på slutet av 1400-talet och det var då jag undrade om du skulle kunna gräva fram den ur bibliotekets gömmor för att den skulle nämligen finnas också enligt min litteratur här på Kungliga biblioteket och vi står nu så vitt jag kan se framför just mm. den boken så vad är det här för en bok? Det är en handskrift från 1400-talet som innehåller ett kollegat band som innehåller många olika skrifter. Man har samlat ihop det som man behöver. Går under namnet Fru Elens bok som klart och tydligt tar fram att det är en kvinna som har ägt detta. Kvinnornas läsvanor är väldigt, väldigt intressanta. Väldigt ofta har de läst bättre än mm. män har gjort. Men här har vi det är en blandning med legender Um, romanser, olika helt fantastiska diktverk till och med. Uh, ofta, är, uh, ofta är kvaliteten på uh, språket skiftande, med andra ord det är ett, uh, ett bruksspråk även som används. Och mitt i detta, som ni ser hur tjockt allt detta är, mitt i detta finns uh, schackstavelselek, helt enkelt den första översättningen. Här har vi um, en försvenskning av en tradition. Jag skulle nästan säga om vi samlade ihop våra favoritböcker och har dem bredvid sängen hemma, uh, de som vi återgår till med jämna mellanrum, uh, då skulle vi kunna säga att detta är något sådant. Det är det som man kunde läsa när man var på väg någonstans, sittande mm. i en man. Så. så det här, man kan säga att det är en lärd kvinnas beställning av olika ja, bitar ur vi vet, vi vet inte exakt hur det har gått till. Vi vet inte, uh, vi vet att det fanns uh, uh, kvinnor som läste som hade medel att kunna beställa. Uh, och här är det ett av de få exemplar som vi har och det är ganska tidigt faktiskt uh, på det svenska området om man tänker på 1400-talets andra hälft. Thank you for watching this episode of Chess TV. Don't forget to check in again on the 6th of May when we're back with a new episode. So see you then.